Shy. Morning, everyone. Sorry, I'm just a few minutes getting started here. There were more geese in the way when I was trying to walk from my building, so I had to sort of detour around them. They're getting uh, kind of threatening. Um, so it took me a few extra minutes to get here. Um, as uh, Before we get started, um, as I mentioned in the uh, announcement that I just sent around, I've tried to rework things so that we can accomplish everything for today. Uh, within the first half of the class. Now, that might mean that the first half takes a little bit longer than it normally does. So rather than an hour and a half, uh, it might be like an hour and 40 minutes or something like that. Uh, but I think we can then accomplish everything before the break uh, so that we can just end a little bit early uh, rather than come back for an extra hour or something like that. So we won't be losing any content. I just sort of reorganized things a little bit uh, so that we can cover what we need to cover in a shorter amount of time. Uh, seems like a really nice day to enjoy the rest of the afternoon. I also know that a lot of you are probably busy with, uh, how many of you are getting ready to do your thesis uh, posters this weekend? Is anybody in the class doing that? Well, there might be some of the class that are doing it who just aren't sitting here uh, who are also getting their thesis posters ready. Uh, it's a busy week, uh, so we'll try to end things a little bit early. Um, any questions before we get started? All right, great. And let's do that. So um, this is a uh, general example that I've used in the past uh, for years, um, long before COVID became a concern uh, for Canadians and people all over the world. Uh, the usual concern when I teach this course in the wintertime, which is now, uh, is that, you know, there's a seasonal flu. It goes, you know, we've had a seasonal flu for as long as any of us can remember, right? Uh, and it's something that most of us don't get every year. Uh, most of us probably get a flu shot or have gotten a flu shot or think about it, uh, but not everyone does. So some, every so often you get the, maybe you've gotten the flu once or twice. Uh, maybe you've gotten the flu two or three times. Uh, maybe never. Uh, maybe you usually get a flu shot. Maybe you don't get a flu shot. But the fact of the matter is on average, uh, and this has changed a little bit because of COVID as a pandemic. Um, on average, uh, we can imagine that about 5 to 20% of the population is going to get the flu every year. Uh, it's been lower in the past two years because the things that stop COVID also stop the flu from spreading, right? So if people don't gather, uh, if, they don't, uh, if they wear masks more often, uh, if they tend to be a little bit more vigilant about spreading uh, disease or being in close contact or washing their hands, all of the things that uh, you would normally want to do to stop from spreading COVID will also stop spreading the flu. So it's gone down a little bit, but as you probably know, this past year it went up a little bit more. Uh, so especially before uh, at the end of uh, the fall term, uh, there was a little bit more flu than there had been in the last few years. Um, and on average, we're looking at somewhere around uh, 10 to 12,000 uh, hospitalizations every year. And this was true before COVID, uh, and it's still true. Um, and on average, uh, it accounts for you know, several thousand deaths uh, across the country. Uh, and uh, this hasn't, this, like I said, this reduced a little bit during the COVID time, mostly because people were getting sick uh, from COVID early on. Uh, and then later, because people were doing things to stop from spreading COVID, so it also stopped spreading the flu a little bit. Uh, likely, as things sort of return to a uh, more conventional uh, way of doing things, we'll see this number kind of return. So on any given year, there's a, I wouldn't say a good chance, but there's a chance that you're going to get sick some year. On any given year, it's going to be small. Uh, most of us probably, like I said, have had the flu once or twice. It doesn't happen every year for most people. Uh, but over the course of your adult life, it's likely going to happen at least once or twice. And the same is true for COVID, by the way. Uh, some people haven't uh, been sick over the last three years. Uh, our other people have been sick once or twice. Uh, but over the next few years, everybody will likely have some chance uh, of being sick, being sick a few times. So the question is, when you know this, when you know something about the basic base rates, and you know something about the risks of uh, getting sick, whether it's with the flu or with COVID, uh, how do you adjust your behavior? What kind of decisions do you make? Um, we've seen this, of course, most recently this academic year uh, at Western, uh, because 
we went through a lot of quick changes this year. So most of you have been through a few years dealing with COVID precautions and pandemic changes, uh, whether that meant the year of 2021 where everything was online. Uh, probably many of you didn't even, if you weren't from London, you may not have even moved back to London, uh, right? You could do all of your courses online because almost everything was being offered online that year. So that's a big change. Um, this year, uh, we went through a lot of quick changes from being super prepared to not being uh, interested at all uh, or uh, reducing things really quickly. Um, and so one of, one of the things I'm, I want to highlight is when do we decide uh, whether it's the institutional decision or a personal decision uh, to make some of these changes. So you probably remember back at the beginning of 2022. So think of the end of summer, you're getting ready to come back to university. Um, and the university says, okay, we've got two things we want you to do. One, we expect you to wear a mask indoors, uh, in lectures uh, and in some other indoor settings. Uh, that's gonna be true. And I think most people kind of expected that to be the case because although last summer was reasonably, uh, you know, reasonably low in terms of uh, worrying about COVID, most of us I think were probably expecting uh, to come back to university and see an increase uh, in the number of cases. I certainly was. Uh, and I think most people were probably on board with that. Maybe a little bit more controversial was the decision to ask students to get a third uh, vaccine. Uh, and I don't know how many of you, I'm not asking you to raise your hand about whether you know, I got a third vaccine, but uh, most people uh, were expected last year to have two. Uh, and this year there was the expectation that you get at least that third uh, booster shot. Um, and you probably remember that that was then delayed. Uh, so as students came back, uh, there was a decision to extend that a little bit, extend it a little bit more, uh, extend it into the next term. And as far as I know, that's not, the, is it no longer the case? Uh, so I don't think it's the case anymore that they expect three. Uh, I think they always encourage uh, three. Um, when we started back this term in uh, 2023, uh, the general rule was everyone should still wear a mask uh, in class. Uh, and I think I even made a, a comment about how it looked like somebody was trying to give us a hint because there were boxes of masks. Uh, and I think the university was trying their best to make sure that people had uh, you know, the choice or the decision to be able to do what they thought was best, but also to reduce the likelihood that there would be a shift and that we'd have to you know, transition to online courses. That was one of the biggest worries is that we would see a return to some of the uh, you know, some of the changes that had to happen or some of the uh, preventative measure measures. So that was dropped too. So somewhere along the line, we went from being fairly concerned at the beginning of the year uh, with asking people to change their behavior and make decisions. Uh, and then Western made some decisions that eased those things. So what I wanna talk about is what went into those changes? What are the kinds of evidence? What sort of evidence did uh, the university use? What sort of evidence do you use when you make those changes? So I'm gonna ask you to think a little bit about some of the ways in which your attitudes, decisions, judgments, and knowledge and beliefs have changed over the last two years when deciding where and when to wear a mask to avoid gathering uh, and to avoid getting sick or getting others sick. Uh, so before we get into a couple of these quick uh, surveys, I'm sure all of us probably are prepared to go back to whatever we need to, right? Uh, if there were some new change, if there were a new mutation in COVID, for example, that changed its behavior to be more deadly. Uh, we know how to do that, right? We know how to uh, return to wearing masks uh, on crowded settings. I got to be honest, when I was flying back from my February break vacation, uh, it was kind of a crowded plane and it seemed kind of filthy. Uh, and I just wore a mask the whole time because I didn't want to get sick on the way down and ruin my vacation. And I also didn't want to get sick on the way back and ruin my vacation. So there's lots of cases where I think, you know what, I'm perfectly happy uh, sealing myself off, masking up and not spreading and not uh, uh, contacting things. So I think there are lots of cases where most of us are perfectly happy to adapt our behavior based on the circumstances, the risks, the benefits and uh, the base rates. So. With that in mind, let's look at a couple of examples here. Uh, and then I'm gonna ask you to do a couple of surveys. We'll come back to this slide uh, in just a minute here. I have my floating meeting controls. 
Let's click this, let's move this out of the way. Uh, this is kind of hard to see. I'm gonna come back to a, a dynamic version of this after some of our surveys, but this is kind of where we stand uh, now. Uh, and this ranks all of the things we need to worry about, uh, most of which I never used to worry about, but now I worry about all of them. Uh, so these are the things that we need to worry about in terms of how easily they spread and how deadly they are. Um, lots of things are spread very easily, like the common cold or the Zika virus uh, or syphilis, easy to spread, but they're not particularly deadly. It doesn't mean they're pleasant, uh, but they're not deadly. Uh, there might be some cases where uh, these might lead to other complications, uh, but the spreadingness of some of these things, uh, sometimes they're really contagious, uh, like chicken pox and shingles, for example, very contagious, but not deadly. Uh, you can get a vaccine uh, for chicken pox, or you can uh, get a second vaccine to protect you from shingles, which is the same vaccine. Very painful disease if you have it, um, but not particularly deadly. On the other hand, there are things that are uh, not necessarily very contagious, but super deadly, right? So different kinds of plagues, for example, untreated HIV, for example, uh, spreads easily and is also fatal if it's not treated. Uh, treated, the situation changes a lot. Uh, rabies, for example, there's been one person in the history of North America who did not die from rabies. Uh, otherwise, if you get rabies and you don't treat it, it's 100% fatal. Uh, so although it doesn't spread very easily from person to person, uh, it spreads easily from animals to person through bites. Uh, and that's why if you're bitten by a dog or a raccoon, uh, we don't even bother asking uh, if the raccoon has rabies. You just go through the treatment uh, because if it's too late, uh, it's too late. Uh, there's no chance of coming back. So some of these things are super deadly, other things not so much. And we know a little bit about all of them, right? We know about some of these things that can be prevented by vaccines. We know about some of these things that can be not prevented by vaccines. We've got treatments for some, uh, we've got treatments for others. And here is where uh, COVID is kind of now. It's about as, it's a little bit more contagious uh, than some of, than the flu. Uh, it's about as contagious as the cold and it's more deadly uh, than the cold. Um, and it will change as things change, right? As it spreads and mutates. Uh, but eventually it kind of, you know, the suggestion is it's gonna kind of settle down here in the lower left-hand quadrant, which means it's gonna be a problem in the winter time uh, in countries where people go indoors a lot in the winter time. And it's gonna be less of a problem in the summertime in places where people are outside uh, in the summertime. Uh, and it's gonna be a problem in waves, but it's not always gonna be a problem like it was uh, two or three years ago. So let's see how close I need to be for this to, oh, cause I touched, yeah, if I ever touch this, it doesn't, it takes me back out of here. So I wanna ask you two um, surveys. Uh, this first survey, given what you know right now about COVID, uh, what you're experiencing right now over the last uh, week uh, and going into the next week. So within a two week period, given what you know right now, um, what is your personal decision if it's not required about wearing masks in crowded settings, whether it's this lecture, any lecture, plane, or something like that. So in a crowded public setting, uh, what is your current uh, belief uh, or opinion uh, right now? So click on the link uh, and fill out the survey. It's a simple yes or no. Um, we'll look at that. But after you do that one, I also want you to click on this next link and answer a couple of questions. And then we'll look at those together and compare them with data that was collected last year uh, because people's mindsets were really different last year at this time because we had just come off of another lockdown. Uh, and we'll look to see what, how, how some of our attitudes have changed. And while you do that, I'm gonna pull up the data screen here.
All right, so let's take a look at some of these answers. Uh, if you're still clicking some things, that's fine because uh, the one that asks you to click a few things uh, will still be open uh, while we're looking at some of these others. So first of all, let's look at the current, let's look at our current class here. So I think this is us. Um, and this is not surprising. I mean, this is probably what most, uh, you know, where, where most uh, people are uh, in terms of a decision. Uh, so this includes all possible scenarios, whether it's relatively spaced out like this classroom uh, or condensed like a train. Uh, so I would probably, if I'm riding a crowded train to Toronto, uh, I'll probably put a mask on uh, because the air is not very good on Via Rail. <laughs> Uh, the air is slightly better on the plane, but not necessarily. On the other hand, if there's lots of space and you're not going to be there for more than half an hour, people make different decisions. Uh, and you can see that most people, uh, when the requirement is lifted and people feel reasonably safe about things, uh, the decision that a lot of us have made is that, yeah, probably wouldn't. Um, and we'll go into some of the reasons why we think that's the case. And again, one of the things we'll notice uh, in this particular uh, lecture is that there's no right answer for these. So usually there's never a 100% decision. There's usually something like a 60-40 split or a 70-30 split or something like this, an 80-20 split, where a lot of people do one thing, but other people make the other decision. They're both decisions, uh, and we're interested in what changes, um, you know, what's going to change your decision. If we look at what happened last year, um, so this is the same class last year. Uh, of course, masking was still a requirement at Western. Uh, and everyone wore a mask in the classroom. I wore a mask when I was teaching. It was a common thing to do, uh, and it was expected. Uh, and most people said, if it were not, if it were no longer required, if Western dropped the mandate uh, tomorrow, the majority of us still wanted to wear a mask because it was at a time at which there was a lot more concern uh, about elevated cases. And you remember what it was like last uh, March, right? Last March, we had just come off of uh, the Omicron surge uh, where there was a lot of worry about how long that was gonna extend. Uh, and so most of us adjusted our behavior, our expectations and our beliefs based on that base rate, uh, whether or not it was gonna be, there was a lot of it in the news, there was a lot of it in the community, uh, and also probably a lot of uncertainty about what would happen if we did uh, stop wearing masks, because I think a lot of us did not want to return to a fuller version of a lockdown. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that uh, changes your behaviors. But that seemed clear so far. So when we look at some of the reasons why, um, I think what, what I would expect to see is that most of us uh, say, yes, our decisions have changed. Um, and a lot of the reasons are that public policy has changed. I don't. I should have asked the follow-up question: Would you wear a mask if it were required? But I suspect that people would. Uh, most of us would continue to wear a mask if it were required uh, by the community. Uh, I think we saw a little bit of change when Western made it a requirement just for uh, lectures. Uh, but when the community and the province uh, and the London Middlesex Health Unit, uh, the university uh, school boards, and everybody was sort of on the same page, most Canadians were on the same page. We should. Uh, do these things. Um, people's beliefs also inform some of these things. Uh, a minor, a, a smaller group of us said we already had COVID and it's no big deal because it actually is a big deal. Um, nobody in the in this particular group endorsed the idea that you didn't think it was ever really a problem. Uh, however, another one that comes up kind of high, uh, the two, the three that I kind of expected would be the highest. Uh, it's not required, number one. Uh, it's part of life now. And so we've had to adjust our expectations and our beliefs and our behaviors uh, to deal with the fact that it's not going away. So, you know, stopping a spread is different from dealing with seasonal waves. Uh, the third is that we don't think about it as much uh, when people aren't, when, you know, universities aren't making uh, requirements, uh, when there aren't uh, signs, when there aren't messages, uh, we aren't thinking about it as much. What does that remind you of if you're not thinking about it as much? That should make you think of something like uh, availability or recency. Uh, so the ease to which things come to mind or the most, you know, if something is discussed 
uh, a lot in the news or in the media or by uh, other uh, official sources, it's going to change our behavior a little bit. So one last slide I want us to look at, um, and there's two of them here. This one is just a link that I'm not going to use now because it's a link to this, uh, uh, this site here. But I want to look at this one just briefly. This takes just a second to visualize. This is what the... Um, So let's go all the way back. So all the way back to 2020. This is just for the province and you know that the province isn't testing people but uh, on a regular basis but people do still uh, if they're going to go to the hospital or going to go see their family doctor or uh, any other sort of health uh, unit based on being sick with COVID, those things are going to re uh, be reported. Uh, here's where we were last year, and you can sort of see why people's behavior was a lot different. Uh, we had just come off of one of the biggest uh, spikes in terms of the number of cases. Uh, of course, it was not only prevalent as a base rate, uh, it's also prevalent in people's minds. Uh, there's an availability working there. There's a recency working there. Most of you probably remember uh, coming back from uh, winter break uh, and either coming back sick or coming back when everybody else around you was sick uh, or coming back being worried about it. And I think that was true for just about everyone. Um, we didn't see that this year. And I think that has really changed a lot of people's behavior. Uh, I'm not part of a decision-making group uh, at Western that decides how to change these policies. Uh, but my guess is that when this didn't happen, uh, the university was less uh, willing uh, to require things like masks uh, in lecture settings, uh, which allows people to make the decision for themselves based on personal risk, whether or not you're around people who are sick, whether you've just come back from a crowded uh, vacation and those kinds of things. So there are a lot of uh, changes that have happened over the past few years, but this is one of the biggest ones. Uh, last year to this year has just changed the base rate. Uh, it's prevalent, but it's not prevalent in a way that seems alarming or that seems like an outlier uh, or that's going to change the way you think uh, about uh, your behavior. So I want to get into all of these uh, topics over the next few slides. Now, there's a pretty good chance this isn't going to work when I try to make it big. I can't believe it worked uh, when I made it big uh, because... <laughs> All right, so let's take into a, so what is decision-making? How do you make decisions about your behavior, whether it's in a pandemic, uh, whether it's behavior about what you're going to do next week, uh, whether it's behavior about how to allocate your resources for preparing for exams or preparing to do assignments, uh, or just how to allocate your resources on a daily basis. Decision-making takes into account the base rates, like how much flu or how much COVID uh, is in the community. Uh, with benefits and risks. So the benefits of wearing masks in public versus the risks uh, of changing your behavior over the long uh, period of time, the risks of COVID, uh, and then optimizes your outcomes. So whether it's on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, a long-term basis, or an institutional basis, uh, there's both individual and collective decision-making at play here. But there's a lot of challenges for most of us when we're making decisions. For example, uh, uncertain outcomes. This was really true last year uh, because we didn't know when that Omicron spike was going to spike back, was going to drop back down. Uh, so it's just not clear what was going to happen. With respect to Western's decisions about uh, its changes for this academic year, uh, public health officials, Western uh, officials as well, wasn't clear what was going to happen over the winter. Uh, would there be another spike or not? Um, and so these uncertain outcomes uh, mean that in some cases you want to be overprepared, you don't want to be underprepared for these kinds of things. Uh, there's also unknown probabilities. Uh, we've talked about the likelihood of in, uh, encountering different scenarios, the, the likelihood of encountering different, uh, you know, of getting, to, uh, getting sick in different scenarios, but for the most part, you don't know uh, what the base rates are. And that's, of course, what made COVID in particular such a challenge for most people uh, is that it was relatively new in terms of its transmissibility, its fatality. 
Uh, there was a lot that was unknown about it, and it was still evolving as people were dealing with it. Uh, for some of those other diseases that we showed on the plot, uh, you, there's a lot more that's known about them in terms of when they're expected to be fatal, when they're not expected to be fatal. Uh, you probably remember early, early on in the uh, the pandemic when there was really a really a lot of unknowns, right, in terms of how fatal things were going to be. So people changed their behaviors quite dramatically early on because we just didn't know what was going to happen. And then finally, we make a lot of our decisions uh, on concepts and on our memory and heuristics. So based on availability, uh, representativeness, uh, we make mistakes sometimes because we're just trying to uh, make decisions based on what we did the last time or based on what worked uh, the last time. And that's one of the reasons why we see a lot of variability in people's responses to things like, uh, you know, making responses to things like disease preparedness or making uh, changes in response to uh, academic plannings, whether or not you're picking a, a graduate school or a post-graduate uh, decisions that, that you're going to be making. Um, many of you may be looking for a place you know, where you're going to move next. How many of you are, is anybody here fourth year finishing up? Uh, so you've got somewhere, you've obviously got decisions to make, right? Uh, you're going to be graduating this year and presumably moving on to something else, whether it's a professional program, a graduate school, a job, employment, back home, uh, taking some time off. Uh, you may be looking for places to live, uh, whether or not uh, that's here in London or in Toronto or other parts of uh, Canada. So all of those things are going to come into play. And you've got individual biases, but also contextual biases. So the steps that you go through when you're making a decision uh, are first off uh, the identification. Uh, and lots of things affect the ability to identify a decision. Uh, sometimes it's really obvious uh, whether or not I should wash my hands <laughs> uh, you know, extra uh, during a, a disease setting, or whether or not I need to uh, declare a major in your first year or your second year. Um, you've got intent to register. You're planning to come back next year. Well, that's a decision that needs to be made. And it's usually pretty explicit. Right? The university sends you reminders for when you need to do these things. But sometimes the decisions aren't always clear when you need to make them. Um, we can also frame, and we'll talk a little bit more about framing later on uh, this morning, but uh, framing are the contextual uh, variables that change uh, how you interpret. Uh, so you've identified that a decision needs to be made, but you can frame it based on how it's explained to you. Uh, and that can be sometimes beneficial because it can help you see lots of the other, uh, you know, other variables uh, and other uh, parts and aspects of the decision, but can also be not so helpful because people can frame a question in a way that influences your outcome, maybe not to your benefit, but to someone else's benefit, to the framer's benefit. Once these things have happened, you've identified it, you've used your attention, working memory to identify that a decision needs to be made, you've contextualized it and framed it or it's been framed for you, uh, we can generate some alternatives. I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. Uh, we can evaluate these alternatives, uh, determine whether or not there's going to be a cost and benefit, uh, and then we can select uh, one of those actions. Now, a lot of times decisions are made without thinking about them. Uh, so many of our small day-to-day -day decisions are often made uh, solely uh, by framing them and choosing the option that comes to mind first. Uh, so using heuristics, uh, doing something because you've always done it that way, using a routine. Uh, but other decisions, you clearly go through some kind of explicit weighing of the alternatives. How many of you are going to be looking for um, a new apartment uh, in the next few months, uh, a new place to live? Uh, so that's a stressful experience, right? Because they're unbelievably expensive uh, relative to two or three years ago, right? So you're looking to spend more money, uh, but you don't want to spend a lot of money, but you also have to take it. What are some of the things that come into play when you're looking for a new apartment? What are some of the things that you use when you weigh the alternatives? So location, you want to be in a location that's probably close to transit uh, or close uh, to where you want to work or, or planning to work. Uh, and also not around something that's maybe too busy uh, or too sketchy. Right, so like what it includes like utilities or is it just the room? Right, so you want to know exactly what is what am I getting for this 
uh, whether it's 900, 1500 or $2,500 a month, what am I getting for this? Am I getting just a room? Am I getting a room in a kitchen? Uh, do I have electricity and hydro built in or not? Uh, so other, so things like that. What are some other factors? How many roommates am I gonna have? How many roommates am I gonna have? So am I gonna be rooming with uh, two people? Uh, one of whom I know, or are there six people in the house, several of whom I don't know, uh, and what kind of conflicts might come up? How many kitchens are going to be shared among those six people? Uh, what are some other factors that might uh, weigh into your decision? Uh, house, apartment, or like basement or something. So house, apartment, uh, you know, upper flat, a basement, a condo style apartment, a high rise. There are lots of decisions. Uh, and of course, some of them are easy to compare. Price is on an easy metric, right? Uh, you can say my budget is uh, $1,200 a month. Uh, and in London, apparently that used to buy you a fairly nice apartment. Uh, it gets smaller. <laughs> $1,200 doesn't uh, go as far in London as it used to, and it doesn't go very far in Toronto at all. Um, so if that's your budget, uh, then you have to take into account some of these other things. And some of them are easy, like this thing, this price is easy to compare. Location is easy to compare because you can put it on a map and you can say, how long is it going to take me to get to class or to work from this location? But other things like, uh, is it a high rise? Is it a, a second story or is it a basement? Those are harder to compare because each one of them has different pros and cons and costs and benefits. Uh, other things like how many roommates am I going to have to share it with? It can reduce the price, uh, but it can also increase the anxiety uh, depending on what those roommates are like and who their friends are. Uh, and so on. So some of these things are easy to compare, some of them not so much. So that can really change the selection of the action. And of course, uh, there are other things like pressure. Uh, how quickly do you want to get that apartment? Uh, how quickly do you want to lock in on something? Uh, are there other people interested? How many of you, when you've looked for an apartment, uh, have been told by the landlord, well, there's two other people looking for this right now. Uh, can you come and sign it uh, today? Um, and it's amazing that you're always the first one and there's two other people that they'll hold off. Uh, but you don't want to like call their bluff because you also want to find an apartment. But that seems, that's a, you know, that comes up all the time. So you're, there's some pressure put on you to make a decision now before you go look for some other things. And that comes up even more if you're buying a house, of course, because people are bidding on the same house uh, and you don't want to get outbid, especially if you're really looking to buy something that you need to move into sooner rather than later. So let's talk about some models and theories of decision-making. I wanna spend about the first 15 minutes talking about this rational normative model. We'll talk a little bit about probability, talk a little bit about Bayes' theorem and priors, uh, and we'll talk about how people deviate from this rational model. Then we'll switch into talking about uh, framing decision heuristics and uh, knowledge effects uh, in decision-making. I estimate, I'm not 100% sure, but I estimate we'll probably finish up around 11 o'clock, I think. Uh, that's my goal is to finish up around 11. Uh, so the rational or a normative model sets a standard, and it's based in an economic theory that suggests that people will choose the alternative that costs the least and gets the most, right? I mean, that's basic economics, right? You want to spend as little amount as possible so that you can benefit as much as possible, and you want to weigh those two options. Uh, most organisms behave that way biologically. You want to do the least amount, you know, expend the least amount of effort uh, for the most amount of gain. Any of you that have a cat as a pet, like I do, realize that the cat spends very little energy uh, throughout the day, especially if you feed the cat several times a day, they almost have nothing to do. So they spend all day sleeping because the next meal is just right around the corner. All they need to do is get up and pace around a little bit and somebody's going to feed them. So uh, there's a lot of biological reasons to suspect that humans and like other animals make their decisions this way, uh, that we don't want to experience, we don't want to lose much. We don't want to lose whether it's energy or uh, resources or money. Uh, we also don't want to experience much uncertainty, uh, so we want to reduce the likelihood of choosing an option that has uh, uncertainty connected with it, uh, and we also want to benefit. So we're trying to play all of these things off with each other. So in order to do this properly, and humans can make decisions that are rational, the problem is we don't always have the information. We need some pieces of information to be able to make a rational decision. Uh, we need to have an expected value for all of the possible outcomes. So we need to know over the next 
infinite number of tries or next year or next month or whatever, uh, over the next, over the long run, what are all of these options? How do I gain from them? And how much do I stand to lose from them? And what is the probability of gain and loss associated with all of those outcomes? So in order to make a good decision, you need to know all of that. So if you're trying to decide between four different apartments, let's say, uh, you need to know how long is this rent going to be stable? How long am I planning to live there? How much does it actually cost me? What am I planning to earn over the next uh, two years? Uh, are there any unforeseen uh, expenses? One of you mentioned uh, whether or not utilities would be included. If those are included, fine. If they're not included, you don't know how much that's going to change. Roommates could change uh, the uh, hydro usage uh, considerably depending on what they also do, right? Uh, then you've got to figure out how to split those things. So you can see how it becomes really complicated uh, early on to try to weigh all of these alternatives. So we need to know what cost, we need to know what benefit, and we need to know probabilities so that we can choose the most valuable option in the long run. Um, it's really simple if you have everything laid out for you. So if you are given some option that would gain you $40, small amount of money, so something that would gain you $40, um, and you've got a probability of 20.2, 20% 20 likelihood of that option working out for you, uh, otherwise you don't gain anything at all. Uh, so I would liken this to putting something up for sale on Facebook Marketplace there's a chance that somebody's going to contact you and buy it. I just happened to sell a pair of uh, one of my kids' track shoes uh, with the little spikes on them for last year's very short high school track season, a uh, very short track career, um, 40 bucks. So these are $80 shoes. You sell them for $40. Uh, I had no idea. They'd been sitting on there for a while. Somebody contacts me. Uh, I gained $40, but it costs me nothing to put them on Facebook. Uh, so for as long as they're sitting on Facebook Marketplace, I'm not paying anything on it, right? Uh, so there's no cost for the outcome. There's a little bit of a gain and there's a chance of a gain. So maybe on any given day, there's a 20% chance somebody's going to buy it. That means that over the long haul, I stand to gain possibly $8 every time I try to sell something like that. Right? Maybe it doesn't sell. Most of the time it doesn't sell, uh, but it doesn't cost me anything to not have it sell. Uh, so this is a, a gain over the long run of $8. Does that make sense? So you're taking something that when you get it, when you win, uh, you get $40. Uh, most of the time you don't win, but when you do, it starts to add up. So on average, if you were to do this for the rest of your life, uh, on average, every time you try to sell something, you would make $8. Most of the time you don't make anything. Some of the times you make $40. On average, it averages out to 80 to 8 you adjust the probability uh, and you adjust uh, the, uh, the actual gain. So if it's a more attractive offer with a higher probability of success, but a lower gain, uh, over the long run, you actually gain more. Uh, so you might get less for every win, uh, but if you win more often, uh, it increases uh, the likelihood. So expected value is a combination. It's a combination of what you get, what it costs, and the probabilities associated with each one. If you know those things, you can make really good rational decisions uh, and you can choose the thing that is the likeliest to benefit you the most over the long run. But there's a couple of caveats here. Uh, first of all, we don't usually know those things. And second, uh, we don't know how long we're gonna be doing something, right? So we might adjust our behavior based on short-term gains rather than long-term expected values. So a rational model works if you know the base rates, you know the risks, and you know the benefits, and are not swayed by your own beliefs or biases. You can be, you can make really good decisions. Um, you won't always get the right outcome, uh, but over the long run, you will be reasoning in a rational and optimal sense. The problem is we almost never know all of these things. And if you don't know these things, then the rational model starts to break down which means you rely on your own beliefs and bias. If you don't have access to uh, probabilities, gains, risks, and so on, and base rates, then what you do have access to is your own memory. Uh, and so you use biases, you use your heuristics, which can sometimes introduce bias. 
So let's talk briefly about the probability. One of the things you need to know uh, in a good decision, to make a good decision, is the probability of your decision producing the outcome that you expect it to. Uh, so the probability of uh, you know, your behavior having the effect that you expect it to. In other words, uh, if you're looking to rent an apartment, what's the probability that those things will work the way you expected them to? So if you're choosing between an apartment that has, you know, you're choosing an apartment that has four roommates and you think you know what those four roommates are going to be like, what's the probability that they are going to be that way, right? That they're not going to change their behavior. Um, so probability in general is going to study, uh, tell us something about likelihood and uncertainty. Uh, and when we're talking about probability in decision-making, uh, it's normative or prescriptive. Uh, so normative meaning that it counts how things uh, should uh, usually happen. Uh, prescriptive meaning that it describes how you should behave if you have access to this information. Uh, those would be your optimal decisions. Bearing in mind that most of us don't have access to base rates, probabilities, and so on. Uh, and so we often deviate from rationality uh, and optimality. That would be more of a descriptive theory that describes how people actually behave. So in the text, uh, I talk about three different versions of uh, how humans assess probability. Uh, I almost always ask on the and this I has a probability of nine, nine, 99% likely that I will ask on the final exam a question where I ask you to list these and describe them uh, or list them and define them or list them and give an example or something like that. They will almost always nearly certainly uh, be a question on the final exam that asks about Barron's uh, probability theories. Uh, the first that most of us use kind of optimally, not always optimally, but the one that we're the most familiar with, uh, and it's probably the best for most human behavior and describes what we do the most often, are frequency theories. Uh, these aren't always strictly optimal because they depend on your personal experience with something. Uh, but frequency theories suggest that you make judgments on the basis of past frequency. So how likely is it that people around you have been sick with the flu? or sick with COVID. That's gonna change your personal experience with it. So past information uh, about COVID, about vaccines and so on, uh, it requires experience. Uh, if you're looking for an apartment to rent, uh, if you've done that before, uh, if you've had several good experiences with renting apartments from a particular type of apartment or in a particular neighborhood, uh, then that gives you some prior experience. Uh, if you have behavior, behavioral experience with how to study for an exam uh, that works well for you, then you know certain kinds of ways to prepare for an exam that have worked well in the past, and you'll continue to use those uh, in the future. So prior experience can inform these frequency theories. We're kind of tracking stuff as we go. Like knowing like stats and this would be more personal experience, but it also includes your knowledge of uh, actual statistics. So whether or not you know that something is prevalent, uh, that can also be part of your uh, frequency theory. But the basis of a frequency theory is that you, as you go through life, you're tracking uh, experiences with things. When I do this, this happens. And when I make this decision, this other alternative happens. And you remember those things. Some of them you remember better than others. Um, so this is the general way in which most of us uh, make our decisions. Two other alternatives, both good and bad. Uh, a second alternative are strictly logical theories like the rational model that I discussed. This would be based solely on logic and knowledge of probabilities. So irrespective of your personal experience with something, if you know that there is a certain likelihood of something happening, or you know that there's a certain probability of something happening, you would base your decisions on those uh, outcomes. Or you base your, base your decision on the, the knowledge of those outcomes. This works really well for things that are known as exchangeable events, things for which if you exchange the surface uh, characteristics of something, if you exchange the specific instantiation 
the underlying probabilities don't change. So really clear examples would be things uh, like casino games or cards uh, or raffles or anything for which it doesn't really change uh, the behavior. You know, if, if you buy a raffle ticket on one day and you buy a raffle ticket the next day, as long as it's the same gamble on the same raffle, uh, it doesn't matter which store you buy it from. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, which, if you were doing roll up the rim on Tim Hortons back when you used to be able to roll up the rim, right? It doesn't matter which Tim Hortons store you buy it from, your chance of getting a winning cup is the same. Uh, and so you would likely behave in the same way. So those, those are good decisions to, I mean, if you just want a cup of coffee, you just want a cup of coffee. You're not buying a Tim Hortons cup of coffee to try to win, right? Uh, but those are examples of things that are exchangeable events. Uh, the day doesn't matter. You know, which coin you toss to get heads and tails doesn't matter. Uh, the probabilities are uh, formalized, abstract, uh, and uh, mathematical in this sense. So logical theories, most of us still use when we know they are clearly exchangeable events. We know that it doesn't matter which coins we're tossing or which dice we roll, the probabilities are, uh, are an abstract quality associated with that kind of event rather than with that individual coin, that individual lottery ticket and so on. Uh, we also are influenced by personal theories that go beyond just frequency. Uh, in other words, we may have beliefs about things that might change even our observations. We might deliberately downplay some evidence uh, and likely that changes people's behavior, uh, particularly when we were dealing with uh, the first and second round of uh, COVID case spikes, right? People might have changed their behavior based on their personal beliefs about the recommendations to get a vaccine uh, or their personal beliefs about the recommendation to wear a mask uh, and so on. And that might, might line up with uh, frequency, but it might not. Uh, so you might be adjusting your behavior based on a belief that doesn't uh, correspond to objective reality. So personal beliefs are different from frequency theory, which are also personal, uh, but these are personal beliefs that might not necessarily uh, line up with direct uh, frequency experience. Uh, so they're exaggerated beliefs uh, based on things that might be happening. Does that seem clear to everyone? So we've got frequency theories, we've got logical theories, and we've got personal theories. For most of us, probably for all of us, all three of these come into play. Uh, we do a lot of stuff based on frequency, but a lot of us have beliefs that are sort of idiosyncratic and might not line up with somebody else who has the same experience. Uh, so two people might have the same basic frequency experience and the same knowledge of base rates and make really different decisions because their beliefs are different. Uh, and their personal experiences might be the same in terms of objective experience, but the belief uh, and uh, contextual experiences might change. Uh, and so those things can really affect uh, decisions as well. Um, so for logical theories, we'll go through this really quickly because this probably repeats stuff that you've seen before. Um, but over the long run, we're looking at something between one and zero. Uh, if something can never happen, it has a probability of zero. If it always happens, it has a probability of one. Uh, we saw with uh, rabies, for example, uh, that has a probability of 1.0 of causing death if it's not treated, right? So rabies uh, is a disease that is 100% fatal, um, as opposed to the common cold, which is well down close to this zero uh, percent. It's not impossible, but it's very close. So we're getting, we're approaching zero and we're approaching one for those uh, extreme scenarios. But for most probabilities you're dealing with, uh, it's somewhere in between. Uh, when you feel really certain about something, it's approaching one. When you feel really uncertain about something, uh, it's somewhere in that middle zone, uh, somewhere around a 50 percent probability. So in any case, you're considering all of the possible outcomes, the simplest obviously being uh, you know, a coin toss, uh, determining whether or not you get to receive the kickoff uh, in a football game can be uh, decided by a simple toss of a coin and can have a huge effect uh, on the game depending on how close things are gonna be. Um, you got all the possible outcomes, heads or tails, there are two possible outcomes, 
And you, as the person choosing the coin toss at the beginning of the game, uh, you want to choose one outcome. So you staked your entire team's future uh, on the ability to either take the plate first uh, or to receive the kickoff at the beginning or in the second half or whatever. Uh, and so you have, here is my desired outcome. Here are two possible outcomes. Of course, the reason you toss a coin in a, a sporting event like that is that it's a perfectly even chance, right? Uh, you've reduced everything to one out of two. You've got a 50% chance of coming up. doesn't matter how many times you toss the coin. Uh, if you toss it a thousand times, on average, around 500 would be heads, but it's never gonna be exactly that, right? Uh, there's always a chance that it could come up heads 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 times in a row. Uh, that's a low likelihood of having that many heads coin tosses in a row, but it's plausible, right? It's plausible you could toss a coin a thousand times in a row and get a thousand heads in a row. It's not impossible, it's just improbable. So if you get 10 heads in a, in a row, so we're tossing a coin uh, and you get 10 heads in a row, What's more likely, another head or another tail? Most of us know that it's still an equal likelihood, right? Uh, a sequence of 11 heads in a row seems kind of kind of unusual, right? Seems unusual and surprising to have that many sequences, you know, that many head tosses in a row. If you were officiating a game uh, and every time uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers were calling the coin toss, they called heads and they won. Uh, you would think there was something suspicious. Over two or three years, let's say the Pittsburgh Steelers always win the coin toss, always by calling heads. Somebody would notice that and they would say that doesn't seem right. But it does seem right, right? On any individual coin toss, it's always going to be 50%, which means there's always some times where there's going to be a lot of one or a lot of the other. Because these are independent events. One is not dependent on the other. Uh, you can do the same thing with rolling a six. You've got one uh, desired outcome, six possible outcomes. Uh, you can do the same thing if you are uh, looking for multiple desired outcomes. If you want to see a rolling a number less than four, uh, then you have three desired outcomes, six possible outcomes. It changes the probability. Uh, if you've got a 52 uh, deck, a 52 card deck, lots of possibilities, which is more likely. Some of these based on your personal uh, beliefs or your frequency or your knowledge are more important, right? This is an important hand uh, in poker because uh, it would be unbeatable. This would be an unimportant or a less important hand in poker, but each one has the same likelihood of coming up exactly that way because we only have 52 cards and we're only drawing five possible cards. Uh, some of them have uh, greater importance ascribed to them, uh, but they all have the same likelihood of coming up. But keeping track of this is not easy, right? This is not an easy number to keep track of. It's not easy uh, to combine things uh, in this way, which is one of the reasons why humans, when given the chance, uh, will default to knowledge and heuristics because trying to calculate all of these probabilities on the fly uh, as quickly as possible is not easy. Um, so I mentioned independence. Uh, most events, especially for these exchangeable events, uh, we know them to be independent events, coin tosses and card draws and dice rolls and lottery games and casino games have an independence associated with them. Uh, the outcome of one event does not influence the next outcome. Uh, when we combine those probabilities, we multiply them, meaning that uh, the likelihood of the entire sequence of events gets smaller and smaller and smaller uh, each time you add uh, some alternative to it. So likelihood of drawing one card, one out of 52, the likelihood of drawing a second card, uh, one out of 51, those two things are multiplied for any possible sequence of cards, uh, which reduces uh, the probability of getting any particular two card sequence uh, by a fair amount. We confuse these things a lot though, most of us do, because we don't always know whether or not things are dependent. And also we like to uh, imagine that, we like to imagine that there are, uh, that there's a certain lawfulness uh, to the way probabilities work. We expect these things to be lawful. Uh, and doing so uh, can also be a fallacy known as the gambler's fallacy. The most obvious version of the gambler's fallacy is that we assume that 
these probability, we act as if these probabilities are not independent. So if you are playing some sort of, uh, whether it's uh, sports gambling, uh, casino gambling, or anything that has chance associated with it, uh, there are lots of times where you sort of feel as if you're on a, on a winning streak. How many of you have ever felt like you're on a winning streak in something? Uh, what was your example? Um, <clears throat> just like a card game with friends. So you're on a winning streak. So if you're playing poker, you're like, I'm on a winning streak. Other examples of winning streaks? Uh, NFL preseason. A lot of bets. <laughs> What's that? NFL preseason. You had some good bets? Uh, so you're on a winning streak, right? And of course, you know a winning streak uh, is exactly just that. It's a, it's a combination of events that would be low likelihood uh, over the long run, but you just happen to be in that period where things are going well for you. Um, what happens when you're well into a winning streak? Do you feel compelled to keep going or do you feel like at any moment now my streak is gonna be over? How many of you would wanna keep going if you're on a winning streak? I mean, most people do. This is the gambler's fallacy is that you feel like I'm on a streak. And what's worse is being on a winning streak shifting over into a non-winning streak and thinking, okay, well now I got to get my money back. Uh, now my luck has to turn again because you know, I got a certain chance of getting this outcome. Now I'm getting the bad outcome, but I know if I can just play one more, I'll get back into winning streak uh, zone. Uh, and that's a, gam that's a fallacy because if it is, if they are independent events, uh, and most of these kinds of events we're talking about have some independence or total independence. Uh, you're just in the middle of a string of events that you don't know exactly how long it's going to be. Uh, you don't know how long either of those streaks are going to be, but most of us feel as if uh, we should get back into something. There was one year, I don't think I have these plotted here. I used to have them plotted on the next slide. I think I took it out. I used to have a there's one year where I, they actually did the Tim Hortons roll up the rim and I went something like 38 cups in a row without a win. Uh, and I calculated how likely it's very low likelihood to go that many cups in a row without a win. And I kept thinking like, at some point, I've got to get a winner. I need a free cup of coffee. And I felt compelled to continue to buy coffee from Tim Hortons, even though I didn't like it. Uh, because I thought one of these days, like they say, it's like at one in 12 chances. And I'm coming up on 40 cups in a row, like over a series of, you know, oh, well over a month of coffee buying. And I hadn't won anything. I think I was starting to buy two or three cups a day because I wanted to win. And I was sort of in, in, it was infuriating that I hadn't won yet. And I thought one of these days, I've got to win. Like it has to come closer to that probability match. That's the other kind of gambler's fallacy you see, by the way, is when uh, your own personal experience with something doesn't seem to match your belief of what the underlying probability should be. So if you see a sequence of heads in a row, that doesn't seem as random because it doesn't look random to you. So for multiple outcomes, because rarely are we dealing with a single probability, for multiple outcomes, we can multiply them uh, if we know they're independent. So this is known as a conjunctive probability. What's the probability of this and this happening to me? For a conjunctive probability, uh, it reduces uh, the likelihood on each uh, possible uh, occurrence. So what's the likelihood of me winning on this bet and this bet and this bet? goes down each time because if each one has a probability, you multiply them together. That's the winning streak, right? Uh, you might get a winning streak, but the likelihood of a winning streak is lower and lower the longer you expect that winning streak to happen. However, most of us also understand something about cumulative probabilities, which is over the lifespan, over the course of doing this event, uh, we might talk about a cumulative or probability. What's the likelihood of me getting a winning Tim Horton's cup of coffee on any one of those 30 days, not 30 days in a row, but on any one of those 30 days. So in other words, what's the probability of me getting two heads or two tails? Or what's the probability of me getting, uh, having a successful bet on this day or this day or this day or this day? So one successful bet out of 10, as opposed to 10 successful bets. You combine these in different ways. The Cumulative probability is added. So the more observations, uh, the greater chances you have of something happening. A lot of us make decisions when we're driving 
uh, that confuse these things as well. So I'm not gonna ask you to put up your hands here, but how many of you think, you put up your hand in your mind, how many of you have accessed your smartphone while you're driving, uh, which you know is against the law, and also you know it's dangerous, but when you do it, which most people have uh, been tempted or have done it, uh, picked up their phone while they're driving, uh, you don't usually get in an accident, right? Uh, usually you do it, you look around, there's nobody in front of you, you're at a red light or you're slowing down, you look briefly, you look up, and the likelihood of something happening unobserved in that small chance, you know, that small window is pretty small, right? The likelihood of being in an accident each time is pretty small, but the likelihood of it coming back to haunt you over every single time you do it cumulatively uh, gets higher, right? So on an individual basis, we think there isn't much chance that it's happening. And of course, if you're a frequency theorist, if you're using a frequency theory, if you've accessed your smartphone in the past, uh, over the last few years while you're driving and nothing bad has happened to you, uh, that's what your brain is storing. That's what your mind is storing is that when I look at my phone and I'm driving, nothing bad happens. Uh, and so from my perspective, it feels safer than it really is. But over a two or three year span of driving, uh, that's adding up a lot of low probability events. And as you add up all of those low probability events, eventually it gets to be a higher probability event. So if you're looking at your smartphone over the next five years while you're driving, uh, it's, there's a much bigger chance than you probably realize uh, of something happening. Uh, we see this misapplication of the AND rule. We've talked about this in the past. So uh, the Linda example, this conjunction fallacy is a misapplication of the AND rule. We didn't talk about it like that when we talked about this uh, in our reasoning uh, lecture, um, but it's a misapplication of the AND rule because each one of these has some probability associated with it. Uh, bank teller and feminist can't be more probable than bank teller alone. Uh, because we're combining these things with an and. As far as we know, there's an independence here. And if there's some probability of being a member of the feminist movement, and there's some probability of being a bank teller, when you combine them, it's got to be lower than either one of them because you've multiplied those probabilities together. We're not talking about the probability of Linda being a bank teller or a feminist. We're talking about the probability of being a bank teller and a feminist. Uh, so that even if one of them seems likely, active and feminist movement, uh, it's gonna combine with bank teller, which is lower likelihood, and it's gonna reduce the likelihood of either one of those. So let's talk briefly about Bayes' theorem. Uh, from Bayes' theorem, I then wanna talk about ignoring base rates. Uh, I wanna talk about uh, prescriptive models of uh, decision-making, and then we'll talk about some non-prescriptive or uh, descriptive models of decision-making. Still keeping on time here, uh, though maybe it's going to be 11.15. We're still going to get out early, uh, but maybe a little bit longer. So Bayes' theorem is a prescriptive model that takes into account all of the stuff we've talked about. It takes into account your frequency theories, takes into account knowledge of base rates and probabilities, uh, and tries to understand how people make decisions about things um, on an individual basis. So when you make an observation about something, you take into account the things that you know from the past, frequency theories, take into account uh, individual behavior. Um, Thomas Bayes, who may or may not look like this, uh, no one actually knows uh, who Thomas, what Thomas Bayes uh, looked like, uh, but this is what may be one possible drawing of Thomas Bayes from the 18th century. Uh, there's no other actual portrait. This is just who comes up uh, when you search for Bayes. This is some guy uh, that my, may or may has some probability of being Thomas Bayes. Um, suggested there's a mathematical analysis of behavior. Um, most of us don't operate according to Bayes' theorem all the time, but sometimes we do. Uh, so Bayes' theorem takes into account, you've probably heard some of these ideas, and if you're interested in behavioral economics, if you're interested in human behavior and decision-making, or if you're interested in uh, things like uh, sports betting or gambling or different kinds of outcomes, these are really important things to know. Um, you want to know the prior probability of some outcome. 
the probability that a hypothesis is true before you see any evidence. So I'll sometimes call that the base rate. In Bayesian terms, it's called the prior probability. In other words, before I have to make a decision, before I assess any evidence in front of me right now, how likely is it that this thing could be true based on what I know about the world, right? So whether it's disease uh, or a winning team or some kind of outcome, this is your prior probability. We're gonna call this the uh, pH. So the probability that some hypothesis is true before the evidence is considered. The second thing you need to know is a conditional probability, the probability that a particular type of evidence is true if a particular hypothesis is true. So when you're making a decision, uh, this P evidence given hypothesis, so if what you believe is true, so a particular hypothesis is true, um, what's the conditional probability that the evidence is associated with that. So what's the conditional probability that the evidence is true given that a hypothesis is true? That's another piece of information. Uh, and you're trying to calculate this uh, posterior probability, the probability that a hypothesis is true after considering some evidence. So this is something you need to know. This is something you need to know. You combine them to figure out whether or not when you observe something, uh, does it support your hypothesis? The probability that a hypothesis is true after considering the evidence takes into account these things. Well, how does it work? It specifies how to combine this prior probability of a hypothesis with the conditional probability of, of the evidence that you want to consider uh, to determine the posterior probability of the hypothesis. So the example I've used in the past has to do with uh, coming home and finding that someone has broken into your house uh, or your car, uh, which happens more often than you'd probably like it uh, to happen. No one so far has broken into my house and stolen anything yet. Um, however, uh, people have broken into my car and stolen things out of my car. How many of you have had your car, uh, whether you know, broken into or the door opened up. So it does happen, right? It happens in London on a semi-regular basis. If you leave your car unlocked, like I did that one time, uh, people go into it and will take stuff out. And I don't know how many other times I left my car unlocked that year. It's probably happened a few times. It's one of those cars that I don't have my keys, but you know, you walk away, the key fob locks the car. Uh, so sometimes though, you can have it work that the key fob does not unlock the car because you've opened up the back door and then you've closed the back door and somebody else has already been far away. There can be some scenarios where the car, car door doesn't uh, stay locked. So probably happened that one time, came out the next day and things had been stolen out of my car. And I knew because the door was left ajar. Uh, the person didn't close the door. Why wouldn't you close the door if you break into it? Uh, you might leave it just partially ajar. Uh, you don't want to hear a slam. Uh, maybe you don't want to hear the bell, you know, the little dinging sounds. You want to make sure it's partially closed, but maybe you don't want to slam it uh, closed the whole way. So use that scenario. The burglar is in the house. Here's a premise. Then the door will be ajar. So if somebody's in your house, they leave the door open while they're in the house. They don't want to make any noise and close the door. So they leave it open. They sneak in and they steal stuff. You come home. Your door is left open. What's the first thing you conclude? Now, if I come home and my door is left open, one of the first things I would probably conclude is that somebody bro broke into my house. Uh, and that maybe I left it unlocked, but they went in and they took something out because I don't leave my door open any other time. So we, first of all, I want to point out that this is a non-valid affirming the consequent logical reasoning error. So from strict logical deduction, this is not very good because there are other reasons that the door could be ajar. Um, but what we wanna do is determine using Bayesian reasoning uh, and our knowledge of probabilities, base rates uh, and likelihoods, whether or not this is reasonable evidence. So let's fill it in with some basic information here. Let's suppose <clears throat> that the probability of a house or a car in my neighborhood being burglarized on any particular day not just my house, but any house. I live in a bad neighborhood. I don't really, but let's say I live in a bad neighborhood. And on any particular day, there's a one in a thousand chance, a 0.001% chance that a house will get broken into. 
uh, and people will steal stuff out of it. So that probability would be 0 0.001 or one out of a thousand. So the probability of a uh, probability of this happening, this is your prior probability, um, which means that the house probability of a house not being burglarized is pretty high, 0.999. All right, so we got a small chance of it being broken into on any given day, that's your base rate, and a higher chance of it not being broken into any given day, that's your other base rate. So those are the prior probabilities. It can get broken into, it can not get broken into. This is your conditional probability, uh, the probability that a particular type of evidence is true if a particular hypothesis is true. How likely is it that the open door would actually occur after a burglary? Now, I don't know the information here. Let's just say that 80% of the time when someone breaks into a house, they really do leave the door ajar. So it's most of the time. Let's say that most burglars do this. And we could, if we wanted to, find out how likely that, that is based on uh, forensic evidence, police investigations, and so on. So uh, in a real burglary, regardless of the base rate, if a burglary happens, 80% uh, of the time, uh, the thief leaves the door hanging open. Uh, which means that 20% of the time they don't. Uh, so we also want to know, though, how probable is it that the evidence is true if a particular hypothesis is not true? So how likely is it that the open door would occur but not after a burglary? So the evidence is there, but for a different reason. And let's just say rarely. Uh, there's very other, there are very few other reasons for you to leave your door open. You're really good about leaving your door closed. You would never, almost never, uh, walk out of the house without locking the door, okay? So it does happen maybe every once in a while, but generally you wouldn't just leave your door hanging open. So in order to use Bayes' theorem, we take into account all of this information. The probability, so these are our posterior probability, the probability that a hypothesis, your car, your house had been broken into, is true after seeing the evidence. My door is ajar. So you come home, the door is open, and you say, using Bayes' theorem, my knowledge of, of priors and my knowledge of conditional probabilities, how likely is it that someone has broken into my house? We can calculate that based on taking uh, the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis and multiplying it by the probability of the hypothesis. In other words, the base rate. And we divide that by, uh, again, this probability of the evidence given the hypothesis and the hypothesis. So we combine that uh, and we then add to that the probability of the other options. In other words, the door is ajar for other reasons, for not the hypothesis. Uh, and uh, the, door, the door is a... a that those other reasons would uh, occur. So how likely is it that those other reasons actually occur? So we're taking into account what we want to know, dividing it by all of the possible outcomes. So this is a much more complex looking version of that same coin toss. Uh, that was a simplified version. What do I want to know? And what are all of the things that could be known about this particular scenario? What's the desired outcome? And what are all of the possible outcomes? With the numbers that we gave you, uh, that might be an 80% chance of a door being left ajar after a burglary. So 80% likely that the uh, burglar leaves the door open. Uh, and here's your base rate of uh, the house uh, being burglarized. You divide that by the same thing. There's 80%, uh, you know, burglar leaves the door ajar 80% of the time. And there's on any given day, a 0.001 chance of your house being burglarized, but you combine that with uh, chances that you would leave the door ajar for other reasons and all of the probabilities of the house not being burglarized. In other words, all of the times that the house might not get broken into. And what you find is that it's a small number uh, because there's so many chances for your house not to be burglarized. Even what seems like strong evidence the door being ajar. Um, and the fact that you rarely leave it open for any other reason, because the base rate of burglary is so low, uh, it means that the chance that that evidence is actually useful to you, the chance that that evidence is going to tell you something useful uh, is quite low. In other words, it's a 0.07 chance 
if you were um, faced with evidence that was only 7% likely to be informative to you, you probably would ignore it, right? So what this means is that we, if you come home and your door's ajar, what do you think? Uh, you probably think something suspicious is going on. I would, um, because I never leave it open. Uh, and because a thief would definitely leave it open. Uh, and of course, in a neighborhood that's like a decent neighborhood, which is almost all of London, in fact, all of London, homes aren't being broken into, uh, you know, 0.001% of the time. So it isn't even that high. Uh, so it would be even less useful. So what you can see is that we're drawn towards things that seem unlikely. Uh, although Bayesian reasoning would suggest this is not very informative evidence, our priors uh, would suggest uh, this is not very informative evidence. We're still likely to overweight it uh, because to us, this feels like good evidence. You should certainly be wary, right? So you need to take into account other important uh, characteristics. In other words, maybe there isn't really anybody in your house, but if there is, there could be some violence, right? So maybe the low likelihood, but the high risk combines in a way to alter your behavior. This is just another way, we won't go through this. This is just another way to take exactly the same numbers uh, and show how this works uh, in how many different cases. And to show that the point is there's lots of examples of the house not being burglarized. Um, we tend to ignore base rates and base our decisions on what we think is true. A house with a door hanging open looks suspicious. Even if it's almost never a house that was burglarized, it still looks, you know, Still looks suspicious. Kahneman Tversky did an experiment uh, in the 1970s and 1980s. He did a lot of work with how people ignore base rates. Uh, this is a very simple, straightforward example. We'll talk about one with medical reasoning in just a minute. Um, but suppose you have 100 people in a room. You know that 70 are lawyers. You know that 30 are engineers. Um, and then you're asked to, dis to pick one at random. So out of a class of 100, technically this is a class of 100, uh, even though there aren't 100 people here right now. Imagine there are 100 people here. We know that 70 of you are engineers, 30 of you are lawyers, um, or sorry, 70 are lawyers, only 30 are engineers. You find Jack, who's 45 years old, he's got four kids, careful, conservative, ambitious. He's not interested in social or political issues, likes carpentry, woodworking, sailing and computers. How many of you would think he sounds like an engineer, given the comparison between lawyer Tversky's participants thought that this sounds like an engineer, uh, not interested in social issues, uh, really likes stuff like computers and woodworking, sounds engineering-like. And so most people overestimate the likelihood uh, that they've encountered an engineer. The reason is that you base it on your stereotype. You base it on your beliefs. You base it on your personal beliefs rather than the underlying base rate. Although it's clearly much more likely to find an engineer in that group, or sorry, to find a lawyer in that group of 100 people, the description doesn't match. So in the same way that it's very likely uh, to find your door ajar for some other reason, uh, the description doesn't seem to match. So we're not basing most of our judgments on observable logical probabilities. We're basing our judgments on what we think is true uh, and what we think uh, somebody really is, a, a concept or a stereotype. Um, we neglect these base rates. So suppose a serious disease affects 100 out of every 10,000 people. Uh, this would be even worse uh, than COVID in its worst time. Uh, so this would be a pretty bad disease. It's got a 1% base rate. Treatment exists, but it's costly and risky. Uh, like rabies, for example. Uh, it's a risky, it's a painful treatment, not risky. Um, but there's also a test. And so the question is, before you give somebody a treatment that's costly and risky, you want to know that they have the disease, right? You wouldn't want to excise a tumor from someone if it wasn't a cancerous tumor. You wouldn't want to put somebody through chemotherapy if you knew that they didn't have cancer, right? So you would really wanna test for something before you put them through a risky and costly treatment. Um, I talk about my cat all the time, obviously. Uh, how many of you know that cats, when they get older, sometimes have these benign fatty tumors? Uh, 
uh, lymphomas, they're called. They're kind of ugly. It's like a little blob on the back of the cat. It's completely harmless, but it's ugly. Um, and so we feel bad for her. We're like, you don't know how bad that looks, Kitty, because you can't see it on your back. Um, but we think it looks pretty terrible. Uh, and the vet says, don't worry about it. It's not dangerous unless it really seems to be causing pain, which it's not, or it seems to be affecting her mobility, which it's not. Just leave it there and just deal with it because she's you know, 14 years old and it would be, we can remove it for you, but as cats get older, uh, the anesthesia that they used to put the cat under is riskier. Uh, and you know, like, what does that mean? Well, it means the cat won't wake up, right? So the older the cat gets, the more risks they have associated with a surgery like that. So the recommendation is don't do anything unless it clearly is causing a lot of, un you know, a lot of distress. That's exactly what we're looking here when I say costly and risky. So there's a risk with this treatment. It also costs money. Uh, but imagine it's serious now. We want to know if that tumor is something that needs to be removed versus something that doesn't need to be removed. So we need to test. Um, we've got a test rate that is 98% accurate. When you have the disease, that test produces a positive result. So it's got a 98% hit rate. That sounds great, right? If you're a, doing a statistical test on data you've collected and uh, you've got some p-value that suggests uh, 0.02, you think that's significant. That corresponds to a test that comes out 98% uh, of the time showing that something is there. So this is your evidence. Uh, also, it has a low false alarm rate. When you give the cat this test uh, to test whether the tumor is dangerous, only 1% of the time uh, would the test uh, be a false positive. So it's a good test with a good hit rate and a low false alarm rate. This sounds like a really diagnostic test. So the question that physicians might be asked at any given time uh, or uh, health professionals is given a positive test, how likely is it that a person has a disease? In other words, from a Bayesian perspective, what do you, conf what do you infer from a positive test? So the doctor says the test came back positive. Uh, what do you know about this? So what do you wanna do next given a positive test? It's a much harder question than you'd think because the test is much worse than most people realize, including physicians. Most physicians would fail at this test uh, as well because it is counterintuitive. Let's fill this in uh, as we did with the Bayesian example. Uh, so let's assume, let's just use whole numbers instead of probabilities. Let's assume 100 out of every 10,000 people. So that's that 1% base rate. We want to know what's the probability of a disease given a positive test result. So doctor says test comes back positive. What are you going to do next? Um, but if you fill in the numbers, what you see pretty quickly uh, is that given a positive test with this high base rate, if the disease is actually present, 98% of those people actually get a positive test, right? This is our full 10,000 people. 100 of these 10,000 people will have the disease. 98% of them get picked up by the test, so 98 people get the test, and only two of them have a negative test result, so it misses two people. That sounds great, um, but that other half of things, the false alarm rate, which was also really low at 1%, by the way, um, positive test out of the 9,900 people that do not have the disease, only 1% of them get picked up. Problem is that's almost the same number of people that get picked up who actually do have the disease. So when the disease is a low likelihood, that test which seems diagnostic is much less useful uh, than it would appear, right? It's got a high hit rate and a low false alarm rate. Problem is the numbers are almost the same. So when you put the numbers in to find uh, a, sorry, I went too fast here. Put the numbers in to find the probability of the disease given the uh, positive test result. You've got 98, uh, that's the desired outcome, uh, divided by 98 plus 99, that's the undesired outcome. Those are all the possible positive tests. And you've got a positive test that gives you about 50% uh, likelihood. So it's not nearly as effective as it seems. Uh, and the reason is the low base rate. Uh, if it isn't very common if the base rate isn't there, uh, then the test isn't as diagnostic. This is one of the reasons why COVID testing, mass COVID testing was abandoned early on. Uh, once it became clear that there was lots of COVID, but still most people didn't have it at any given time, testing people randomly is not very useful uh, because it's always gonna miss some. Uh, when was the last time any of you used one of those rapid tests? 
I mean, I don't remember the last time I used them. The only time I really used them accurately was when I did have COVID uh, and I wanted to see like, how long am I gonna test positive? Mostly it was just kind of an exercise in the utility of the test. Uh, like I know I'm still sick, how likely am I still, is this test gonna still give me a positive result? And you could sort of track how faint the line got and all of those types of things. But testing everybody would not be very useful uh, because the test, although it had a pretty good, it didn't have a good, it didn't false alarm very much. It rarely gave you a positive result when you didn't have it. It had a decent miss result, you know, miss rate. Uh, it would miss it sometimes. Uh, but most of the times if people were doing that test, they wouldn't actually have COVID. Uh, when is when you do one of those rapid tests, when do you do it? You do it when you actually do have COVID, right? You do it when you think you're pretty sure you have it. Uh, and that's how most diagnostic tests are done. They're not done across the board to the population. They're done with people who already are exhibiting symptoms. Once you're already exhibiting symptoms, you've increased the base rate because now you're not looking at everybody. Now you're looking at everybody who has symptoms. And if you're looking at everybody who has symptoms of a particular kind, you've increased the base rate even more. So what that kind of means is that as the base rate increases by restricting the testing to people who already show symptoms or who go to the physician with a prior history of cancer or who go to the uh, physician with a prior history of cancer symptoms and other test results and pain in a particular area, what you've done is you've increased the base rate by reducing the sampling to people who are more likely to already have that disease. Once you combine all of those things, if you were to increase the base rate uh, by a factor of 100, so now we've got 10,000 people, you've got a 10% base rate, a positive test result is much more useful uh, in a 10% base rate scenario. Now it's 92% likely that a positive test result is associated with somebody actually having the disease. And as I said, most of us, don't reason that way. Most physicians don't reason that way because we see a positive test result and we infer that it means something, but it doesn't mean anything unless you know these other factors, unless you know the base rates. Okay, so I wanna talk about some of these other factors now. We've talked about the probability that goes into identifying a decision and framing it. Now I wanna talk a little bit more about framing effects I wanna talk about how we generate and evaluate alternatives and how we select these actions. Obviously, we're not gonna finish at 11 o'clock. Let's try to get there at 11.30. Is everybody okay to continue without a break though? Because I still think we can get, uh, we can finish about an hour early uh, if I stop looking at the clock and saying, I'm not gonna get there yet. So framing effects change the way in which people make, behave, make choices. Uh, here's the, one of the most well-known framing effect examples it comes from Kahneman and Tversky, um, and they use a variant like this. Uh, and again, disease outbreaks, I guess, were interesting to people all the time, uh, even before COVID came on the scene, uh, preparing for a disease outbreak or a pandemic is still something that's important. So imagine your city is preparing for the outbreak of a disease, and you know that if nothing is done, it's going to kill about 600 people. Uh, so that would be on par with what a city like London might experience over a period of time with something like COVID. 600 people in a short amount of time would be tragic for a city like London for all of those people to die uh, in a short amount of time. So this would be a serious disease. There are two programs that you can do. And maybe these would be things like isolation or uh, mass testing of a certain kind or certain kinds of inoculations. Whatever it is that you need to do to stop this from spreading, there are two things you could do. Then people in the experiment are given a choice. Uh, some people are given this choice. 200 people will be saved or option B, uh, program B, there's a one third probability that 600 people will be saved and a two thirds probability that no people will be saved. What they found is that most people like the life-saving option. Uh, so in a case where it's certain and it's framed around a gain or a savings, a certain gain or a savings. They found that most people liked option A because you're definitely gonna save 200 people. That's framed in a way that is, sounds beneficial, right? You're gonna do something good. You're gonna save the life of 200 people. When you frame the 
the options in the opposite way, although the numbers are exactly the same, 400 people will die. That does not sound like a very attractive option. Uh, and so what they found is that most people choose the riskier alternative, the alternative that there's a 33% chance that no one will die and a 66% chance that everyone will die. That sounds like a risky alternative because you've only got a one in three chance of saving lives. Two thirds of the time, you got a much higher risk of everybody dying of the, of the thing not working. When it's framed uh, as a savings, people show risk avoidance. In other words, they avoid the risky alternative and they choose the sure gain of 200 people, sure savings. When it's framed as a loss and you highlight the fact that one of these choices will guarantee that 400 people will die, uh, people will show risk tolerance uh, because they show what's known as loss avoidance. What Kahneman and Tversky found is that when we're making decisions, we're often balancing our risk avoidance with our loss avoidance. People don't like to take risks if they don't have to, but people also don't like to lose something. And oftentimes loss avoidance looms really large in our decision-making. That's what we're gonna find over the next uh, 20 minutes or so is that we just don't like to lose things, right? Even if there are lots of other options out there, we don't like to lose what we have. We like to maintain the status quo and whatever, you have now, uh, you'll keep, even if it's not the best. Point is it's yours, right? And there's some certainty knowing that you have something. Uh, so people will like to keep things stable. They like certainty effects and they avoid these risks. But when the risks are, put, are contrasted with the possibility of losing something, we'll start to take more risks to avoid losing something. You get a little bit uh, riskier with your behavior to avoid losing something. Um, so in one of these papers, this is one paper, we'll look at a couple of other examples. Uh, this is from 1981. Uh, a lot of this work ended up in Kahneman and Tversky winning a Nobel Prize. There's no Nobel Prize in psychology, by the way. There's a Nobel Prize in economics. So they won the Nobel Prize in economics uh, because this started to found a field known as behavioral economics. In other words, how do people's decisions, how did their behavior uh, reflect economic realities. This is microeconomics at the human scale. And they give their participants problems like this, lots of really straightforward problems. We'll just go through some of these really quickly. Um, so in problem eight, imagine you have decided to see a play where admission is $10 a ticket. As you enter the theater, you discover you have lost a $10 bill. Would you still pay $10 a ticket for the play? The majority of their participants say yes. Set aside the fact that you probably now have a ticket on your smartphone. Uh, this is a scenario where you're paying for tickets with cash money, right? You got a $10 bill. You were gonna use it to buy the ticket when you show up at the theater. Uh, you've lost a $10 bill. You still have one, would you still pay? Most people say yes. However, same scenario. Imagine you've decided to see a play and paid the admission price of $10 a ticket. Now you have the ticket, you've already bought the ticket. As you enter the theater, you discover you've lost the ticket. The seat was not marked, the ticket cannot be recovered. Would you go back and pay $10 for another ticket? And now they find that the preferences have shifted. Uh, and what that means is that you've now lost something that belonged to you. Uh, here, you have $10 at your disposal. You've lost one of them, but you can use another one. It's exchangeable for a new ticket. Most people find that they won't go back out. They won't change their behavior uh, in order to recover a ticket that they've already lost. Somehow the ticket is worth more than $10 once you purchase it. And you might find that's true for a lot of things that you've purchased uh, or own. It's worth more than it really is. How many of you tried to sell something on Facebook unsuccessfully because you've asked for more money than you think it's really worth? Um, if you've ever tried to sell something or buy something uh, that's used, you're thrifting something, uh, you want to get as much as you can for it, but it's probably worth less than you think it really is most of the time. We got rid of a whole bunch of stuff in our house over the Christmas uh, as, you know, I, both of my kids have started to slowly move out. 
So we're going through some things and getting rid of some stuff. We got a little bit too carried away. Some of the stuff that we thought would be of value if we tried to sell it, most of it just went to Value Village, by the way, um, turned out to not be valuable at all. Stuff that's like collector's items are often not very valuable because they're designed to be collectible, meaning they're already out there. Things that are not collector's items uh, may often be really collectible if they're unique. It turned out one of the books we donated to Value Village um, sells routinely uh, on, uh, on, on eBay uh, for several hundred dollars. We immediately went back to Value Village and the book was gone <laughs> uh, because someone had probably noticed it at Value Village to say, this is a book that's of high value. It's a collector's book. Um, so it was... It, we obviously made a mistake there. Got a little bit too carried away with getting rid of stuff. Uh, so this is called an endowment effect. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, other kinds of framing effects. Uh, for example, if you're driving down the road and you notice your car is running low, you see two service stations, another one of examples that they've given. Uh, one station has a dollar a liter. Um, the other station is 95 cents a liter, right? So you should go to station B, right? Because station B is obviously cheaper, but Station A sign says five cents a liter discount if you pay in cash, because as you know, it costs a little bit of money to use the credit card system. So suppose this station here gives you a five cents a liter discount if you happen to pay in cash. Station B says five cents a liter surcharge for credit cards. That means that these card, these gas stations are identical, right? They both charge you a dollar if you use a card, 95 cents if you use a, uh, if you use cash. However, people alter their behavior based on discounts. Uh, the one that's offering the discount appears to be a better choice. And so they found that people will choose a discount uh, even if the values end up being the same. You'd rather pay a dollar with a credit card than to get charged extra explicitly for using the credit card. So this frames the same options uh, in different ways. Uh, this idea of an endowment effect uh, shows up a lot of times with objects uh, in particular. So an endowment effect is a version of what's known as a status quo bias. Status quo bias is the tendency that most of us have to keep things the same. Uh, all things being equal, we wanna stay with our smartphone provider. Uh, we want to stay with our internet provider. We want to stay with people we might be in a relationship with. We want to keep the same things. It's hard to get rid of things. Uh, so we want to keep what we already have, and we tend to give them more value. When that's connected with an object, we often call it an endowment effect. Um, Kahneman uh, and others uh, suggested that, so they give this example of a wine-loving economist we know purchased some Bordeaux wines a year ago where the wines have greatly appreciated value so that a bottle that cost $10 when purchased would now fetch $200 at an auction. So this economist bought an inexpensive bottle of wine. Turns out it's worth a lot. This economist now drinks some of the wine but would neither be willing to sell the wine nor buy an additional bottle at that price. In other words, they've endowed it with more value than it already has. Um, just as an example, the book that I was talking about that turns out that you can buy it on eBay for several hundred dollars, I'm not going to go buy it. I'm not going to spend several hundred dollars on a book uh, that I got rid of freely to Value Village just because it turns out it might be worth a little bit more than I thought, right? And I probably wouldn't have sold it for that much either if I would have known. Uh, I would have just kept it and said, well, this turns out this is actually a really interesting book. We just want to keep the book now rather than sell it. That's an example of an endowment effect. It's a version of a status quo bias. Um, so uh, let's look at a few other examples. Participants in this study were endowed with either a lottery ticket or with $2. Sometime later, each subject was offered an opportunity to trade the lottery ticket for money. Very few subjects chose to switch. So you buy a $2 scratch off ticket uh, at Shopper's Drug, and then you're offered to return it to the experimenter for $2. $2. Most people don't want to do that because even if they lose, which is probably likely, uh, it didn't cost them very much, but they've endowed it with more value now because it might have more value at some point. Uh, status quo bias also comes up in a scenario known as entrapment or sunk costs. Uh, sunk cost bias is a really big one for a lot of us 
uh, with human behavior. The longer you stick with something, the more reluctant you are to give it up. So example, you just spent $12, let's say, uh, to see a movie, but after the first half hour, you know it's really awful. Has this ever happened to you? Uh, you go in to see a movie hoping it's gonna be good and it's really awful. How many of you would walk out of a movie in a theater regardless of, you know, how many of you would walk out just because it's bad? So you walk out because it's bad? Bucks. It's only 12 bucks. I mean, like, so what? You spent $12, it's already spent. And that's the rational choice, by the way. The rational decision is that money is gone. I'm not getting it back, but why should I waste my time also watching this movie that I will never get back? On the other hand, most people, it turns out, would stay. And most people give reasons like, well, I already spent the money. I want to get my money's worth. <laughs> Sorry. I want to get my money's worth. Uh, I might not get the full two twelve dollars worth of entertainment, but maybe I'll get two dollars worth of entertainment. If I walk out, I get zero, right? So most people will give some reasons, but you feel like you're sort of stuck there uh, in this, and this is known as a sunk cost. You've already sunk the cost. You want to get it back. Uh, so these rational models, and sunk cost comes up all the time, by the way, in uh, examples like how long you've been reading a book. Do you want? You don't want to just give it up halfway through, how long you've been with a relate in a relationship. You just don't want to give it up if you've been with somebody for two or three or four years, um, or how long you've been with your cell phone provider. Maybe you feel like you've given them a lot of your time. You don't want to just suddenly cut, uh, cut the cords, or you've paid a certain amount of money at a buffet, like an all-you-can-eat buffet. You want to sort of get your money's worth, right? Uh, so there's a sunk cost. If you spent $40 on a buffet or $50, you feel like you want to get a $50 meal or more uh, because, you, uh, because of the money you've spent. So people do that. Uh, we do feel like we've invested something and we wanna get our investment uh, back. Uh, rational models, in other words, don't always predict human decision-making. And Kahneman and Tversky suggest that these values or this expected value uh, should be adjusted for some kind of reference point. Uh, so the normative model we talked about does not adjust things for a reference point. Uh, in fact, it just assumes that you weigh the alternatives. But if you frame things, gains versus loss, you're looking at the world in a different view. You're looking to what I can gain versus what I can lose. So that's a different reference point. They also suggest that objective probabilities are overshadowed by psychological reality. In other words, what you think is most likely, or how much you've invested, how much you feel like you've invested. And because of that, people show loss aversion. They're averse to losing, even if the expected value is good. And we also show risk aversion. Even if the potential to gain something is good, we don't want to risk it uh, if there's a chance of losing something. So what they've shown instead is that human behavior is not linear. Uh, human behavior shows two things. First of all, I'm going to show you the first half of this objective curve uh, and suggest that the subjective value, in other words, the psychological value of something, is not a one-to-one -one correspondence with its objective value. In other words, a gain of $100, something gets you $100, you sell something for $100, or you do something and you get $100 back, that's pretty good, right? That's better than zero. Getting $200 for it is not twice as good. Uh, most people don't feel twice as happy with gaining a $200 over $100. In other words, it's a concave function. Uh, as you stand to gain even more, it starts to level out. It starts to reach an asymptote in terms of its effects on your behavior. Yes, you're really gaining twice as much, but it doesn't affect your behavior twice as much. Yeah. In increments versus just like a lump sum? Yeah, so increments might change. So the idea of getting $100 here and $100 next week uh, might have the same effect, which would then add up uh, to being different or more than uh, the objective or the subjective value of getting $200 all at once. Uh, so it might mean, but of course those things would then, if it's a sure thing to get $100 every week, uh, it'll start to lose its impact as well. So that'll start to reach this point of what's known as diminishing returns. In other words, you're still getting it, but it doesn't feel the same, right? It doesn't affect your behavior in the same way. 
So it isn't a linear function. And also it's not a, um, it's not a symmetrical function. Here's the same half of the curve uh, showing a gain and a loss of $100. That's an objective value. So objectively, $100 has a certain psychological effect on you. You'll do things in a certain way uh, that will allow you to gain $100. However, it's not the same as losing $100. The prospect, and that's why this is known as prospect theory, uh, the prospect of losing $100 is for most people objectively worse than the prospect of gaining $100. Because we like gains, but we hate loss more. Most of us will adjust our behavior so that we can gain things, but if there's a loss on the table, we will adjust our behavior in a different way. For as much as we like to gain, we hate to lose more. And so loss aversion drives a lot of our decision-making. That's what underlies the sunk cost effect. That's what underlies the endowment effect. Uh, and that's what underlies a lot of those psychological and behavioral decision-making effects we've been talking about, we'll talk about for the next 10 minutes, uh, is this tendency to want to avoid loss. Okay, so we're getting towards the end here. Um, let's just talk briefly about some of these additional knowledge effects often uh, dealing with uh, loss aversion. So one thing is that you often want to have a reason to make the decision. Uh, have you ever explained your decision to somebody by saying, I don't know, like, why did you do that? That is a terrible way to explain a decision, right? Nobody likes to have it, especially if you do something that makes someone angry. Uh, and they say, you know, why did you, uh, why didn't you text me uh, when you got home last night? I don't know. That is not the right answer, right? Uh, because you know why you didn't text somebody when you got home. You just didn't want to say it. Um, so most people don't like that. They don't like not having a reason. So many of us will make decisions based on what we can explain the easiest. Uh, we'll choose an alternative that has a good explanation for it. Um, Kahneman and Tversky uh, showed several examples. We'll talk about two of them. Imagine you've finished a difficult exam and you're walking home. So in a few weeks, final, final exam, you're walking home from your exam, you will not find out whether you pass the exam until tomorrow afternoon. By the way, this time course between uh, finishing an exam and getting the results tomorrow is not realistic at all. Uh, it takes a little bit longer than that. But let's just assume for the sake of argument, you took a tough test, tough exam, and you don't know if you're gonna pass. And it's not clear that you will, and you won't know until tomorrow. Travel agent has an inexpensive, unbelievably good trip uh, to Mexico. Offer expires that afternoon, but you can pay a small fee of $5 to hold a reservation. So it's a, you gotta pay, you gotta pay something to reserve that reservation for you. Do you sign up to take the trip or do you pay the $5 fee? Those are the two choices you have. Do you take it right now, knowing that it's a trip you wanna take uh, and it's a good deal, you can afford it. Do you do it? Or do you put a deposit, a small deposit, to make your final decision tomorrow? It's a non-refundable $5 fee. Majority of people in this scenario decide that they would prefer to put the deposit down. They're not ready to make a decision now. And what they found, um, when they compared it to some other groups, one group was told they passed the exam. Most of those people chose to go. They don't choose to defer. They're like, hey, I passed the exam. This is a trip I wanted to go on. I can afford it. I'm ready to go. Another group was told they failed the exam. They also choose to go because they're like, you know what? I failed the exam, I'm going to Mexico. I might not come back. Um, what they found is that people pay for information that wouldn't have affected their choice because if the passers go and the failers go, these people are only paying because they don't know yet. Uh, they're unwilling to make the decision because they don't have a good reason. They got a reason, they passed the exam, they're celebrating. They have a reason, they failed the exam, they're escaping. Um, these people just don't know what happened. And so they're willing to pay a little extra money to make a more expensive trip because they don't know the outcome yet. Um, we also see this in decisional conflict. And I promise we're getting almost to the end here. Uh, this is seen uh, in, uh, uh, again, this is uh, some, some examples of uh, behavioral economics. 
A classic example of grocery store uh, shopping. You go to Costco, right? And there's lots of things you can sample. Now at Costco, obviously it's more entertainment. Uh, people go through and they just like to taste the things. They're not actually trying to buy one of them. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, but mostly you just want to sample stuff as you go. Um, however, in this particular case, we set up a scenario where one uh, group of shoppers were given a chance to taste any of six gourmet jams or any one of 24 jams. In the six jam condition, 40% stopped to take a test and then 30 proceeded to to buy one. So it's not a huge group, but of the group that stopped, a large, decent portion of them actually uh, proceeded to purchase the jam. But when they were given more options, although a lot stopped, very few chose. Uh, and that's what's known as decisional conflict. When there are lots of options, it's really hard to make a decision. And you've probably noticed this uh, in retail settings in particular. The more options there are, the harder it is to make a decision. Um, I'm paralyzed if I have to go to the shopper's drugstore and buy something simple like deodorant, because there's like a million different examples and they're all pretty much the same. But how do I know what, what, what if one of them is bad? So what do you do in a case like that when you're faced with a restaurant menu with lots of decisions or when you're faced with um, you know, shopper's drug with 30 different varieties of Old Spice deodorant or whatever it is, what do you usually do? You go with a preference, right? You go with your brand preference or you go with something you think you're gonna already know. In other words, uh, you, you don't wanna experience decisional conflict. So you tend to choose the things you already know. Uh, you might go to a restaurant and there's lots of choices, but if you know a buffalo chicken wrap is something because the buffalo chicken wrap at the, at the Wave is pretty decent. I don't know what else the Wave has, but if I ever go to the Wave, I'm getting a buffalo chicken wrap because I know it's reasonably okay. Uh, so I've reduced my conflict by choosing the same thing every single time. Um, another thing that people do is they regret. They want to avoid regret. Um, another one of Kahneman and Tversky's experiments, subjects are uh, come to class, uh, given a ticket for a drawing to win a prize. And at one point, you're given the option to take your ticket, knowing that one of them is gonna be a winner. Suppose everybody in here gets a ticket and I'm gonna draw the winner. So you all get a chance to win. You have an equal chance of winning. It's a one in 60 chance, there's about 60, 50 people here. Would you trade with somebody next to you before the raffle is made? Most people would not trade, even though it doesn't make any difference yet, right? Your ticket is not a winning ticket until the ticket has been drawn. Right? The number that's on there has no greater chance of any other number. The reason they found is that people want to avoid the regret of giving away what would eventually become the winning ticket. So although there's no, doesn't affect the actual outcome to trade with the person next to you, most of us will avoid doing it because we just don't want to experience the regret. Because it would be weird to think like, oh, I gave the person the ticket and now they're the winner. Now what do I do? Like they only won because I gave them the ticket is what you would feel, right? You know, they didn't win because you gave them the ticket. They won because that was the winning ticket. Uh, it, that is not predetermined. It only happens after the drawing. Um, reactants. Uh, we often make decisions uh, in uh, re uh, regarding restrictions of freedom. This came up really big last year when most provinces and countries were trying to get people to get vaccinated against COVID, right? Uh, most of us were required to have vaccines. Uh, how many of you, you don't need to raise your hand, but think about it. How many of you didn't like being required, even though you said, and you probably heard this kind of uh, sentiment a lot, like, I know the vaccine works. I know it's gonna keep people from getting too sick. I know it's gonna probably keep me from getting a very serious case of COVID. Um, and I respect that we would want to have people vaccinated, but I don't like the idea of being forced by the university or by my employer or by the province uh, to have one. That's what most people reacted against. Uh, even people who felt that the vaccine was sensible, they didn't like the idea that it was required. That's known as reactance. We often react uh, to what seems like a limitation of our own personal choice. Final example, um, we'll get through this last one uh, and then that's it for the day. 
Uh, satisficing is a term coined by Herbert, Herbert Simon, and satisficing uh, refers to making decisions based on what seems like the best option at the time when you have limited uh, resources. Uh, so this flies in against all of what we've been talking about as optimal rational decision making. We've suggested that the best decisions are made when you have all the evidence. You've got evidence about the base rates and about the risks and the costs and the benefits. But what Simon found is that most people rarely have that. Simon was working early. He's one of the earliest pioneers in artificial intelligence. Um, and when he was working on artificial intelligence and problem solving in the 1970s, computers were severely limited in their ability to do things. They couldn't do a lot. Uh, it took them a long time to do things. If you have a, a computer program that's trying to solve a problem, and it's trying to do it in the best possible way. It's trying to find the fastest, most efficient way to solve the problem. It might get stuck. In other words, if you're trying to find the best solution, you might get stuck somewhere uh, and never finish because you've walked down a garden path of solutions and you're, ne you're not able to turn around. It seems like you've found the best solution, but you haven't. And so those computer programs would not run. They would hang or they would stall. Uh, because they could never find the optimal solution. They were always finding suboptimal solutions. They knew an optimal, you know, they were given instructions to find an optimal solution, couldn't find one. So satisficing means being deliberately suboptimal. In other words, not trying to be the best all the time because you can't. Choose the first option that is satisfactory. Uh, and most of us, it turns out, do this without even realizing it. Uh, we tend to satisfy. Uh, we find an option that satisfies a goal. It doesn't guarantee finding the best, but it gets us through the day. The best example that I've come up with is one that um, has to do with hiring managers for uh, working at a grocery store. Uh, so in the days before, remember in the olden days when they would give you bags at the grocery store, uh, you didn't have to bring your own bags, you would pay for bags, you didn't have to pay for bags, and you didn't have to check yourself out there was always someone who would run through things and there would be someone else there often who would bag the groceries for you, right? So this could be, I did that in university. Uh, I worked at one of the grocery stores and I was the front end floater, uh, which meant that usually I was bagging people's groceries. Sometimes I would help out over here. Sometimes I would clean up a mess in aisle four when somebody dropped cranberry juice or whatever. So I would just do a bunch of various things. Some of them were grocery bagging. Has anybody ever worked in a grocery store bagging groceries or doing something similar to that cashier type work? Uh, it's not super demanding, right? I mean, bagging groceries for someone as the second person in the line of two when someone's checking out is not hard because most of us do it now ourselves, right? We self-scan, bag our own groceries, not a difficult job. I'm the manager. I need to hire somebody to bag groceries. A hundred people apply for it. The cost of hiring the not best possible person is pretty low, right? If there's 100 people, maybe one of them is the best possible grocery bagger, but I don't have time to go through all 100 people and rate them all and put them through like a, you know, an amazing race challenge of grocery bagging. I just need to hire somebody now. So I've hired the first person who looks like they can show up to work tomorrow. Uh, that's a satisficing approach. I could interview everyone, but that would cost more than the cost of hiring not the best person. If I hire someone who's not the best, they're still gonna do okay. And if they don't, I'll hire someone else. So the final thoughts, and I apologize for going a little bit longer. This was sort of a risk uh, that I took to try to get it done by 11 o'clock. Uh, I still feel like we got a lot of interesting stuff today and we still get to enjoy an extra hour of what looks like a really nice morning out there. Take the time to think through any important decisions you make, but don't think too much about every single decision. So you've got to be able to recognize your own limitations. We all have limitations, limits both personal and contextual. Sometimes you don't have time to make all of those decisions. So recognize your limitations and biases. Try to engage system two when there are difficult decisions to make, like looking for a new job or looking for an apartment or what to do next year or applying to graduate school, those kinds of things. Those are important decisions, but recognize that you don't have those resources all of the time. And sometimes it's okay to satisfy and just make a decision quickly so that you can get on with the next thing. Okay, we'll see you back. We've got two more classes. Is there a quiz next week? 
or is it two weeks from now? Does anybody know? I think it's next week. It's because it is the last day of March. Next week is the last week of March. Okay, so we have one last quiz next week on uh, all of the stuff that we've covered, uh, including the problem solving next week. Remember that we also have a final, final quiz uh, on the last day of class, on that final day in April. Uh, that's a makeup quiz if you've missed one, or it can make up one that was a low scoring, because I'm only going to score the top five out of the, or the top four out of the five quizzes. So you've got an extra chance to make something up. All right, enjoy the rest of the week. I'll see you back here next Tuesday. Yes.